Stretching over 1,000 kilometer from the sandy beaches and rocky coastlines of the Mediterranean, of the center of the vast and inhospitable Sahara, Libya is a country of astonishing beauty and diversity. The citrus and olive groves of the Tripolitanian coastal plain contrast with dramatic desert landscapes and mountain ranges, also with the Murzuk and Aubari sand dune seas and their palm-fringed oasis. The influence of Islam in the legacy of African and Mediterranean cultures, the Greeks, the Romans, the Garamantes, the Ottomans, are all evident in Libya. Among the finest archaeological and architectural sites around the Mediterranean are the Roman cities of Leptis Magna, Lebda, and Sabritha, the Berber Qasrs, fortified granaries, of Jabal Nefusa and the mosques and peaceful courtyards of the Tripoli Medina. The Berber and Arab ethnic groups make up about 97% of the country's population. The Berbers are considered the earliest inhabitants of the country and are thought to have arrived in Libya around 1200 BC. In the 7th century, Islam was introduced by way of Arab traders who sold spices and handicrafts. Over the following centuries, much of the native population adopted Islam and the Arabian influence began to dominate cultural traditions. Today, Islam is the majority religion in Libya and about 96.6% of the Libyan population practices the Islamic faith. The majority of the followers of Islam in Libya belong to the dominant Sunni sect. Tens of thousands of years ago, the Sahara Desert, which now covers roughly 90% of Libya, was lush with green vegetation. It was home to lakes, forests, diverse wildlife, and a temperate Mediterranean climate. Archaeological evidence indicates that the coastal plain was inhabited by Neolithic peoples from as early as 8000 BCE. These peoples were perhaps drawn by the climate, which enabled their culture to grow subsisting on the domestication of cattle and the cultivation of crops. Egyptian inscriptions from the Old Kingdom are the oldest available documentation of the Berber people. The inscriptions record Berber tribes raiding the Nile Delta, rock paintings at Wadi Methendus in the mountainous region of Jebel Akakus are the best sources of information about prehistoric Libya. In the pastoralist culture, that settled there. The paintings reveal that the Libyan Sahara contained rivers, grassy plateaus, and an abundance of wildlife such as giraffes, elephants, and crocodiles. The onset of the Pura Oscillations' intense aridification resulted in the Green Sahara rapidly transforming into the Sahara Desert. The people who settled in the area were called Berbers. Phoenician traders arrived in the area around 900 BC and established the city of Carthage in approximately 800 BC in what is today neighboring Tunisia. While the Phoenicians were busy on the western coast of Libya, the Greeks established control in the east. By 631 BC, Greek settlers had established the city of Cyrene on a fertile land about 32 kilometers inland. Within 200 years, four more Greek cities had been established, constantly resisting encroachments by the Egyptians to the east and the Carthaginians to the west. Eventually, the Greek settlement was overrun by Persia, later to be returned to Greek control by Alexander the Great in 331 BC. However, the city-states constantly vied with each other for power, leaving them vulnerable to the expanding Roman Empire. In spite of the political strife, there was much cultural and economic development in the area. The region grew rich from grain, wine, wool, and stock breeding, and from the cultivation of silphium, an herb widely regarded as an aphrodisiac. A school of intellectuals known as the Cyrenaics, who expounded a doctrine that defined happiness as the sum of all human pleasures, developed in the area. The Roman conquest of the region would prove disastrous for the Berbers. 
the tribes were forced to become settled or leave the area. For this reason, the Berbers resisted Roman rule. The Romans began their occupation by controlling the coastal lands and cultivating the area. It is estimated that North Africa produced 1 million tons of cereal each year for the Roman Empire, as well as fruits, figs, grapes, beans, and olive oil. Along with the Roman presence, Judaism and Christianity began to influence the Berbers. Many Jews who had been expelled from Palestine by the Romans settled in the area, and some of the Berber tribes converted to Judaism. Christianity arrived in the area in the second century AD and was especially attractive to slaves. By the end of the fourth century, many of the settled areas had become Christian, along with some of the Berber tribes. The most influential conquest of the area was the invasion of Arab Muslims beginning in 642. By 644, the Muslims had established control over Cyrenaica in the east and Tripolitania in the west. It is recorded by Ibn Abd al-Hakam that during the siege of Tripolitania, Tripoli, by Amr ibn al-As seven of his soldiers from the clan of Madlij, sub-branch of Kinana, unintentionally found a section on the western side of Tripoli beach that are not walled during their hunting routine. Those seven soldiers then managed to infiltrate through this way without detected by the city guards, then managed to do inside riot within the city while shouting takbir, causing the confused Byzantine garrison soldiers believing that the Muslim forces were already inside the city and fled towards their ship leaving Tripoli, thus allowing Amr to subdue the city easily. Later, the Muslim forces besieged Barqa for about three years to no avail. Then Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, who previously involved in the conquest of Oxyrhynchus, offered a radical plan to erect catapult which filled by cotton sacks. Then as the night came and the city guard slept, Khalid ordered his best warriors, such as Zubair ibn al-Awwam, his son Abdullah, Abdurrahman ibn Abi Bakr, Fadl ibn Abbas, Abu Mas'ud al-Badri, and Abd al-Razaq to step into the catapult platform which filled by cotton sacks. The catapult launched them one by one to the top of the wall and allowed these warriors to enter the city, opening the gates and taking out the guards, thus allowing the Muslim forces to enter and capturing the city. From Barqa, Uqba bin Nafi' led a campaign against Fezzan, marching to Zawila, the capital of Fezzan. No resistance was offered and the entire district submitted to the Muslims, agreeing to pay the jizya, tax on non-Muslims. A clause was further inserted in the peace treaty that part of the jizya coming from the district was to be spent on the poor of the area. In 647, an army of 40,000 Arabs, led by Abdullah ibn Sa'd, the foster brother of Caliph Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, penetrated further into western Libya. Tripoli was taken from the Byzantines, followed by Sufatullah, a city 150 miles south of Carthage, where the exarch Gregory was slayed. From 661 CE to 750 CE, the Umayyad Caliphate, whose home was in Damascus, ruled the Islamic Empire, including Cyrenaica and Tripolitania. The Umayyads, at a theocratic system of rule in which the caliph was considered a representative of God, whose duty was to protect and guard the Sharia and Quran, which is the guiding principle from which Islamic law was derived. There are different perspectives on the conversions and the spread of Islam in the African continent. It is often claimed that the spread of Islam throughout the African continent was due to the efforts of the local Berber merchants and traders who converted to Islam first following contact with Islamic conquerors along the Mediterranean coast and introduced it to their fellow Berber traders and consumers. Questions arise as to how the initial conversions happened and there is no firm answer to this. Historians pose that Berber tribes may have been tempted by the material benefits of the trading advantages and status which conversion to Islam may have brought. During the following centuries, 
coming with existing Berber beliefs resulted in variants of Islam which blended the local beliefs of the Berbers in Islam with the Quran as its guiding text. This tolerance of local customs by the conquering Arabs created a relaxation of practices which further encouraged Berbers to convert to Islam while continuing to practice their traditional beliefs. The conversion to Islam was aided by the introduction of Imams and missionaries who mingled with the local population spreading the message of Islam. However, in later decades, a much more expansive conversion to the religion was credited to the invasion of Bedouin tribes from Egypt and Arabia, spreading the message of Islam into far-flung areas across the Sahara deserts, leading to a widespread conversion of tribal people in Libya. Arab rule was easily imposed in the coastal farming areas and on the towns, as the merchants and tradespeople enjoyed the benefits of the Arab patronage. They were also happy with the ability to practice their commerce and trade and security and peace. Countless locals who converted to Islam then studied it in depth and became scholars and missionaries. The rule of the Umayyads from Damascus in the later Abbasid dynasty from Baghdad was largely confirmed to the coast. In the 720s, Ibadi propagandists, a moderate offshoot of the Kharijites, reached Tripolitania and took root in Jebel Nafusa. There, they formed a local imamate that took Tripoli in 757 and Kairouan in 758. In 761, the Abbasid governor of Egypt defeated the Ibadis at Tawirga. In the early 9th century, the Abbasids' governors in Kairouan, members of the Aghlabid family, became virtually autonomous. They pushed the Ibadis further inland so that they were confined to isolated communities in the Imzab, Jirba, and Jebel Nafusa. At the end of the 9th century, the Shiite Ismailis set up a powerful state in North Africa. Their leader, Ubaidullah, fled Syria since he was a descendant of the hidden 7th Imam, Ismail, and declared himself caliph of a new dynasty called the Fatimids, with its capital at Mahdiya. The Fatimids were the only important Shiite caliphate in the history of Islam, and their eventual aim was to conquer the Arab East. In 972, they took Egypt and moved the seat of the caliphate to Cairo, leaving a local dynasty, the Zidids, to govern the central Maghrib, including Tripoli. The Zidids were Amazigh from what is now Algeria. They abandoned Shiism and paid nominal allegiance to the Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad. In reality, from Kairouan, they independently ruled what is now Tunisia and western Libya and for a while had a prosperous and powerful state. Throughout all these changes, Tripoli was never a capital. Even so, the Aghlabids, Fatimids, and Zidids all took great care of the city because it guarded the eastern flank of their territory, guarding it against attack from Egypt. It became an important waypoint on the pilgrimage routes to Arabia and attracted numerous scholars. The Fatimids built a splendid great mosque with a large minaret that still amazed the famous traveler at Tijani 300 years later. As a port, it traded with Islamic Iberia and the Eastern Mediterranean. All this laid the basis for the later emergence of a city-state in Tripoli. When Al-Tijani visited in 1307, he described a city that was splendid from a distance, but on closer inspection was decaying. He said, as we approached Tripoli and came upon it, its whiteness almost blinded the eye with rays of the sun, so that I knew the truth of their name for it, the White City. All the people came out, showing their delight and raising their voices in acclaim. I saw the traces of obvious splendor in the citadel, but ruin had gained sway. The governors had sold most of it, so that the houses which surrounded it were built from its stones. As Europe experienced a slow economic revival and Spanish power began to increase, the Mediterranean became a battleground for supremacy among the Habsburg Empire, the Spanish and the Ottoman Turks. By 1510, Spanish forces had captured Tripoli. 
but Spain was more concerned with lands further west and entrusted the protection of Tripoli to Malta. By the early 1800s, Muhammad ibn Ali al-Sanusi had begun to have a profound influence on the region. Al-Sanusi gained such popularity that he was called the Grand Sanusi. The Bedouins revered him as a saint. After his death in 1859, his son Muhammad brought the Sanusi order to its peak of influence. Meanwhile, Italy turned its attention to North Africa, becoming a unified state only in 1860. Italy had a late start in the European race for colonies, and it viewed Libya as compensation for its acquiescence to the establishment of a French colony in Tunisia. Toward this end, Italy engineered a crisis with Turkey in 1911. When Turkey refused to allow Italian military occupation, Italy declared war on Turkey. With Turkey facing troubles in the Balkans, it was forced to sue for peace with Italy, essentially turning over control of Tripolitania and Cyrenaica in October 1912. The greatest resistance to the Italian occupation in the early 1920s was led by Umar al-Mukhtar. His skills of guerrilla warfare, his strength, spirit, and zeal would put one of the world's most powerful armies at the time with its superior and modern weaponry and men half his age to shame. Against Italian tanks and airplanes, Umar's active fighters numbered between 1,000 and 3,000 on horseback and for the most part lightly armed, who trounced Mussolini's army forces almost on a daily basis, fighting more than 250 skirmishes and engagements a year. After 20 years of resisting and inflicting severe defeats and setbacks to their unwanted European invaders, Allah sought to elevate Umar's rank in the hereafter and immortalize his heroic status in this earthly life. When he, in his wisdom, permitted that Umar be captured and wounded by Italian colonial forces in 1931. In captivity, Umar was made lucrative offers by the Italians to end the resistance to which he responded that he would not cease to resist until I achieve one of the two highest levels, freedom or victory. And I swear by him who knows what is in men's hearts that if my hands were not bound this very moment, I would fight you with my bare hands, old and broken as I am.